I've got uh, kind of one main point today out of Psalm 16, and you're going to see it over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, but uh, what, we're, what we're doing in the Psalms is we are looking at the most quoted book. It's the most quoted book by New Testament authors. It's also the most downloaded book today. It's the most read book today of not just the Old Testament, but of any book in the Bible. More people read the book of Psalms than any other book in the whole Bible. And what you see is it's a book of these 150 poems and songs, but also prayers. And what Psalm 16 is, is Psalm 16 is not just a song that people have sung for thousands of years. It is a prayer that a man prayed about 3,000 years ago back to God. And so when we look at it today, what we're gonna see is um, uh, there's like one main point that is made over and over and over and over and over again. It's gonna take me a second to sort of set this whole thing up. So let me, get, let me take about three or four minutes before we jump into the text. If you have a company, then you have a, either a mission statement or a vision statement, and what those are there for is to be kind of like a clear, concise statement of why you exist. This is what we do. This is how we do it. This is what we're all about so you can understand our purpose. And so here's one of them. One of them is, quote, to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Who would that be? All right, Google, that's who that is. I don't think you've ever used that before, but Google. Here's one from Tesla. Tesla is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. Here's one that some of you actually use uh, quite frequently, and that is LinkedIn, which is to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. And then you better know this one. This last one, the mission statement is releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. What is that? It's compassion. Well done. Well done. Good and faithful servants. Okay. So here's where we are. Let's say, let's just say for just argument's sake that Jesus one day was going to read the seven habits of highly effective people. And he thought to himself, you know what? I need a clear mission statement. I need a mission statement about what my life is going to be about. There would be a number of different scriptures that would tell us that would be good candidates for the mission statement of Jesus. Luke 19.10 would be a great example. It's where he said, I came to seek and save that which is lost. In other words, the reason my mission for coming down here was to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, you either have experienced part of that mission statement as Jesus has saved you and you become a follower of Christ or you're listening right now and God is at work in your life for you to become a follower of Christ. That's Luke 19.10. Another one might be John 3.17, not John 3.16. That would be a great one as well. But John 3.17 actually says this. It says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We're gonna beat that drum all the time, every time we're together. Do you know what? God came, Jesus came in the flesh, not to condemn you, but to save you, that by and large, what the gospel message is about is about a rescue mission, that God came on a rescue mission for you. A third one, the last one, the one that kind of weaves into Psalm 16, that could be an extremely good mission statement for Jesus is John 10.10. 10. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and you might have it to the full. Or the one I translated it in is you might have it abundantly. So what he says is you have an enemy that tries to kill, steal, and destroy everything good and precious in your life. And you can just fill in the blank there. All right, your marriage, your kids, your influence, your company, whatever it is, God is saying you have an enemy that wants to kill, steal, and destroy that from you. But then in contrast to that, he says, but I've come that you might have not just eternal life, but life to the full or abundant life. And here, here's the statement I'm gonna roll all, all around. And, and it's, it's said over and over and over again in a hundred different ways. Everything you do, Everything you do, all the behavior that you have, all the actions that you take, everything that you do, you do because you think it will make you happy. Everything you do, every action that you take, you are convinced, you think that if I do this, that will give me satisfaction, that will make me happy, that will provide me joy. I'm gonna do that because in the end, it might even, even if it's discipline, if I do this now, in the end, that will make me happy. People drink to pursue that, people have sex to pursue that, people go to movies to pursue that, people play fantasy football to pursue that, people buy trucks to pursue that, people buy golf clubs to pursue that. We do all of that with the pursuit of thinking, eventually this will make me happy. 
There's an old guy a long, 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 long time ago, a lot smarter than any of us in this room that I've mentioned about 10 times over the years, and his name is Blaise Pascal. He was like a mathematician meets philosopher. And he, he sums it up by saying this, all men, all people seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend, in other words, pursue this in. Because of some going to war and of others avoiding it is the same desire in both, attended with different views. The will never takes the least step but to this object, the object of pursuing happiness. This is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. Even the reason, loved ones, you are at church today is because you're thinking in some form or fashion, this will lead me to joy. This will lead me to satisfaction. This will lead me to happiness. We are built in. We're like a cell phone that's looking for a signal. We're always looking and saying, will this make me happy? Will this satisfy me? And in a nutshell, what you see in the Bible's message is, in the Bible, it is a celebration of the fact that Jesus is better than anything or everything else that would come in competition with him. Finding him, pursuing him is where you are going to find the most pleasure, the most joy, and the most satisfaction. And the challenge that we have right now is navigating past the lesser joys that would steal a joy from us and then pursue our greatest joy. And so we're gonna walk through Psalm 16. There's like two or three places we're gonna camp out. But the whole thing is, you know what? We do what we do. We do what we do because we pursue happiness. But the biggest happiness, the biggest joy, the most satisfaction is going to be found in Jesus. See if you don't see it in these verses. Verse one, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. Now just time out right there. The first thing he says is preserve me. It means help, rescue me. I need some help. And we don't know the situation that David is in. If you see that little prescript right at the start, it's like a miktam of David. And by, by the way, nobody really knows what miktam is. I looked at like five different places and they're like, oh, it means this and it's a musical term and it's an apostrophe or whatever. We don't know. But about David, David's the one that wrote about half these Psalms. But unlike other Psalms, we don't really know the situation David is in in this particular Psalm. We don't know. Other ones we do know. For example, next week we're going to look at one where it clearly is needing some guidance and how do I know God's will in my life? That's Psalm 25. We clearly know that. If you look at like Psalm 32 or like Psalm 51, you clearly see that is in the aftermath of the destruction of going and committing adultery and killing Bathsheba's husband. You clearly see that as a confessional type of environment. This one we don't know. It could be maybe he was like scared of the famous story with Goliath. Maybe it's his circumstance. He's like, preserve me, oh God. It's like a nine foot giant and he's gonna kill me and he wants to kill me. Preserve me, help me, oh God. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's family issues. If you read, if you read enough about David and you read about David in like First and Second Samuel, you will see that David had anything but the perfect family. That while God forgave him of his sin, it does not go without consequences. And after this whole thing with Bathsheba, you'll see his family begins to fall apart. And in one of those stories, he's got a son that rebels against him and tries to take over his kingdom. And he's hurting so bad for his son. Maybe it's that. Maybe he's, he's torn up over Absalom. Maybe he's got work issues. He's got a boss. Some of you guys have bad bosses. This guy had the worst boss. I don't think you've ever had a boss that threw a spear at you to try to kill you, but that's what David had. So maybe it's the fact that he is scared and Saul is like trying to kill him and he prays to God, God, please preserve me, be my refuge. Now, loved ones, God never makes a mistake in the word and there's a reason that he did not tell us the exact situation and maybe the reason he didn't paint the exact situation David wrote this in is so that you could then apply it that much easier to your situation. Because some of you, some of you have circumstances that are making you very panicked and you're like, God, I need some help. And you can apply this to your situation. Some of you got family issues, marriage or prodigals or whatever. And you're like, God, I need some help. Preserve me, oh God, be my refuge. Some of you got bad boss, bad work situation. You got a bad health report. And it's like, God, would you help me? Please preserve me, be my refuge. So the whole thing starts off with is a prayer. It's like, God, I need some help. And by the way, where you go in your times of trouble, where you initially go, especially where you go in a dominant fashion, where you go when hell breaks loose in your life, where you go, 
That is your functional savior. Where you go when trouble hits and hardship comes, that is your functional savior. If you go to porn or pills or a person or <laughs> was it a pizza, all right, it's a fourth P. If you go to any of those at all, understand when I go there, what I'm saying is preserve me. Food makes me feel better. Porn makes me feel better. This person makes me feel better. And by the way, if you go to a person or a counselor, one of the God's gifts to us are wise, biblical, Christ-centered counselors. We use them all the time. But a good, wise, godly, biblical counselor is gonna say, don't just come to me. Don't just come to me. Have you gone to God as well? So that's what he's saying. He's like, preserve me, O oh God, preserve me, for in you I take refuge. Verse two, and you see a shift here. He starts going from panic and he starts to go into gratitude. Verse two says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, which when you're saying to the Lord is either prayer or praise, one of the two. Because you're not telling God something to inform him. If I'm saying to the Lord, you are my Lord, you know what you're doing? It's what you just did for the last 30 minutes. You're saying, God, you are my God. I'm fully convinced of your love for me. It's either prayer or it's praise. You are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. The phrase is, David is making a choice. He's making a choice to thank God for all of the goodness that God has shown him in his life. And we've talked about this a hundred times, that we live in a culture that pulls you toward entitlement all the time. We in our DNA, we are pulled and we're always going between entitlement and gratitude, entitlement and gratitude. And one of the things we do a couple of times a year, if you look on my phone, there's a whole note section in there. And what I've done is I've got, I've got, a, I've got a specific area of gratitude for every single year that I've been alive. Now, if you're 20, that means you can have a list of 20. If you're 70, you ought to have a longer list. Point is this, what David is doing is going back, instead of focusing on what he doesn't have, he focuses on what God has done. And you can do that even when you come to church. You walked into church today. You walked into church today. I promise you there's some people at home that wish they could actually walk into church today. There's of you, of you, that you, your marriage, you're like, you know what, I'm just, whatever, I'm taking for granted my wife, I'm taking for granted my husband. I promise you there's people in your section at your campus that are wishing, you know what, I wish I'd poured more into my marriage, I wish I hadn't taken my spouse for granted. I wish I'd shown my gratitude toward them. Some of you, you got a prodigal child and you got other people next to you and their kids are like doing awesome. And so when you have a chance to say, God, I'm grateful for the blessings that you have given me in my life. And you're not, don't feel bad if it's a great time right now. If you, got a, if you got a raise and your kids are doing good and your marriage is flourishing and your health is awesome, don't feel guilty about that. Just be grateful. Just express gratitude that God gave me a bunch of stuff. The dog woke me up at three o'clock this morning. It's hard to be grateful right then, but I was able to sit there in my big old chair and look around in my living room when it's like super quiet and was walking through this again. I was like, God, thank you. Thank you that you got me up early just to look around and see how much stuff and how much, gra how much gratitude started pouring out. So again, just be, just be grateful. Don't be guilty, just, just, just be grateful. And here's one of the things he's grateful for. And I, I, I gotta brag on y'all. Verse three, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. David is saying, I'm real grateful for God's people. I'm grateful. He knew that being with God's people was part of the way that God discipled him and God nourished him and God cared for him and, and all that just like it is for you. But he says, my delight. In other words, God's people brought him joy. In all honesty, we could do this for days. And I've done this a couple of times before, but you can't pass this verse up without just expressing because I just, I talked to a lot of pastors. I'm kind of at that age now where I got some of these young bucks and they're calling and asking me about different things. And when I hear about some of the issues that they're walking through, I'm like, man, I have got it good. Seriously, we have it good. As a, as a, as a church, we have it good. So I jotted down a bunch of stuff, but I'm just gonna give you real five real quick, just stuff that I'm grateful for and the fact of stuff and you what God has done brings great joy. Here are five things. This is not exhaustive by any means, but I gotta, I gotta mention these five. Five things I love about you. Number one, I love the fact that you, it gives me joy that you love the word of God. It gives me great joy that you, <laughs> that you love the word. When, I, when my preacher friends come and preach here, whether it be Joby or JD or Clayton or Dan or Matt or whoever, almost to a man, what all of them say 
is your people lean in when I'm preaching. They're not sitting back there drinking a cup of coffee. They're not sitting back there like, oh, prove yourself. They're like leaning in. They're aggressive listeners. They got like their journals out and their Bibles out and their iPads out. and They're, they're listening. And I love that about you. I love that, the fact that you like, I, that's what I expect. I love that. I love the fact that you all unify around the mission. I love the fact you unify around the mission. Think about what has gone on in the last just five or six years in our country. I mean, all the divisive stuff in our country. I mean, everything from uh, elections to pandemics to national tragedies to national tensions to social media, all that kind of stuff. And if you look around, depending on what campus you're at, there's not a, there's not a phenomenal amount of, of uniformity. In other words, we have people from all different backgrounds here. We got different education levels, different races, different income stratuses, all those kind of things, very, very different, but there is virtually, the drama we have here is called this life drama. I went to, in the last two weeks, I've been to, I went to a finance meeting for the first time in 14 years, all right? And it was awesome, it really was awesome. And I was like, you know what, all that happened in that deal is we went over the financials, but it was all tied into what's the mission of God. There was nothing about, well, this has to be taken care of, that has to be taken care of, you gotta make sure you don't tick this person off, none of that stuff. It was all about how do you, how are we good stewards of the mission that God has given us? I love that. I love that about us. Um, I love your generosity of time. Do you know in the last nine months, 900 new volunteers? Listen to that again. In nine months, there has been 900 new volunteers. You've gone through the reach team orientation. You've begun to serve somewhere. 900, that's 100 a month. If, okay, again, I know, I mean, I, I know some of us are we're not like great in math, but I'm just saying nine months, 900 volunteers, that's 100 new volunteers. And besides that, you already had an army before that. Thank you very much. That's, that, that makes, that is like so joyful to watch. It really is so joyful to watch. I'll give you another one. I'm actually, th I'm thankful for your generosity of your, of your money. I look at the money that you gave out at the start of the pandemic to the servers that had got laid off. He gave like a half million dollars just distributed in hundred dollar increments all over the 828 to make sure that servers, waiters, waitresses, those kind of people, when they shut all the restaurants down, when that all got shut down and all of a sudden Miss Waitress is trying to figure out where's the next meal gonna come from and you all were just right there, here's a hundred dollars, here's a Walmart card, here's this card. That's, that's a phenomenal job on that. When the floods hit Haywood County, you all just stepped up and did a, an actual fund called 828 Strong just to deal with that. You build how you get you get people houses. Great job. Uh, this is kind of like church talk. I think I thank God we don't have to stress over the budget every single year. You all have made the budget like 10 years in a row. So like awesome job in that. You know you're the 10th, you're the 10th largest sponsorship of Compassion Kids in the whole world. You know that? In the whole world, you all sponsor the 10th most amount of kids that you might not ever see in your whole life just to release them from poverty in Jesus' name. And that's good. We're just sitting here in little old Western North Carolina and you guys are doing an awesome job. And then I could just list a whole bunch. I love the fact you love lost people. I love the fact that you love lost people. We get to see hundreds and hundreds of people baptized every single year. 80% of them, didn't, they didn't come to Christ through my preaching. They didn't come to Christ through awesome music. They came through Christ either 80% of them, like you invited them or you shared the gospel with them or you demonstrated the gospel and that began the conversation. So again, community, church, and one last thing. I don't, I don't know how to say this. Uh, I love seeing you in public. I really do. It seems like the last couple of weeks I've seen a bunch of you all out and about. Maybe it's because I went down downtown Hendersonville and then went to Parkway and all this kind of stuff. I love, please come up and say Hello. All right, don't look at, don't, don't sit there and look and go, oh, should I go up and say, please come say hello. Please come say hello. From a few years ago, if, I, if you say hello and you start talking and you don't tell me who you are and I say, hey, big ticket, that is a term of endearment, all right? It is a term of endearment. Big ticket means I love you, I just can't remember your name, but big ticket. And by the way, the only thing you're not allowed to say, please don't come up and say, hey, I go to your church. I go to your church. Don't come up and say, I go to your church, all right? Unless you're like from Florida or somewhere. But if you say, I go to your church, don't say that because ultimately it's not my church. Ultimately it's Jesus' church. And then if you're part of what God's doing here, it's our church, all right? So just say, hey, you know what? I go to our church. If you come up and say that, I won't call you big ticket anymore, all right? So that's, that's the deal, verse, verse four. Now let's sit in this one for a second, verse four. 
the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply that. Now, underline that, highlight that. The sorrows of those who run after another God, they shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The sorrows of those who run after another God. The word God there is a little g, and that's what the Bible's term is for idolatry. Idolatry is just worshiping a false God. That's really what it is. And I know the first thing that kind of kicks into our mind is that's like for people, you know, in undeveloped places, and they still are like worshiping statues and all that. We're too sophisticated. We've like, we're too progressive. We've like passed that. And what I want to just make sure you understand is that over and over and over again, God says the number one issue, the number one competitor for your heart, it's really the number one sin issue, the number one struggle that we all have. And it's the number one thing in the Bible that it says we'll struggle with is, is idolatry. Now, it's just over over and over and over and over again. It's almost like you get tired of hearing about it. It's like, I don't wanna hear about idolatry. Give me something about, give me something else. But it's idolatry. It's kind of like when Elsie Gray stays at our house and, and uh, we watch, if we ever get to the point where we're, you know, it's dark and, or we're finished with all the tricycle and all that stuff. And I'm like, hey, what do you wanna watch? All right, I know what the answer is gonna be. I know what the answer is gonna be. No matter what's going on, no matter what we have recorded, the answer is gonna be, Encanto, Encanto. It's like, what do you want to watch? I want to watch Encanto, all right? And so I'm like, well, do you want to watch anything else? If it's not Paw Patrol, it is Encanto. It's like, it's Encanto, Encanto, Encanto. It's like, if I hear that name one more time, I am just going to take it because that's, I love her to death. So, but when you look in the Bible, you might get tired of hearing it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. The number one struggle you're going to have is with idolatry. And what he's telling us that for is given the chance, we will we will replace God with any object, any person, any ideal, any dream. And here's what idolatry is. Idolatry is basically the worship of an unworthy object. And before you say, hey, I'm not into worship, I'm not really into worship. You're into worship. Whether you know it or not, you're into worship. It's in your DNA. It's the way you were built. You were built to, you were built to, you were built to be a worshiper. In your DNA, everyone worships a God. As the bird flies, as the river flows, you will worship. It is like standard equipment that comes with your personhood. The question is not will you worship, the question is who or what will I worship? Somebody put this, you take all the choir robes, you take all the religious trappings away from worship, worship could be defined as you putting your hope to something and then chasing after it. You putting your hope in something and then pursuing it or chasing after it. That if I catch this thing and pursue this thing and give my life to this thing, that it will give me value. It will give me significance. It will give me security. It will give me identity. And loved ones, what we got to understand is every advertisement, all the marketing is geared toward you being a worshiper. You understand that? It's geared toward it. I mean, think about it. The advertisements you see, no matter what, if you're on your laptop, if you're on television, if you're wherever it is, all the advertisements are marketed to the worshiper in us. Every advertisement basically says, if you're unhappy, if you're bored, if you're depressed, then buy this product. You'll be saved from your unhappiness and your boredom and your depression. If you get this, if you have these friends, if you buy this car, if you get this medicine, then guess what? Your boredom and your depression will be gone and you will be you will be happy. And so they market all of that. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong necessarily with that. It's just that it overpromises. It overpromises. It just promises something that it ultimately cannot deliver. That's why the Bible says it leads to sorrow. Now the sorrow can be about two different ways. Sorrow can be the fact that you finally understand, you know what, that promised something that it couldn't deliver. And some of it's kind of funny. Then when you buy into the, you watch the beer commercial, and everybody in the beer commercial is like beautiful and they got like six pack abs. And the, the, it's what's inferring is if you drink our beer, you will be beautiful and have six pack abs. And I know I'm not the first to tell you this. That won't happen, all right? That won't happen. You'll still look the way you look. You'll still have the same friends and you won't have a six pack. You'll have a beer gut. That's what you're gonna have, all right? So just trying to pop that balloon. You're not gonna be cool just because you got a certain car. It's telling you. Your life is not gonna be fully and finally satisfied if you have a certain house on a certain street. It's just not, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm just saying that's not going to solve the issue. The divorce lawyer who's advertising on a billboard, listen, 
He is not gonna bring happiness into your life. And he's also not gonna point out all this stuff wrong with you. So some of the time, some of the time it's just over-promising and then some of the time it's just consequences. When you chase after other gods, if we were to have a testimony time in here, there are numerous people at our church today that have blown up their life because they bought into the God of fantasy and went and cheated on their spouse. Now, sometimes by the grace of God, that marriage is saved. Rarely is that marriage ever the same and even more rare do the kids ever look at that spouse or that parent the same way again. The fact that you were the hero when Johnny was 12 and he's 14, he's finally out, you're cheating on his mom. He's not gonna look at you the same, bro. I'm just telling you, he's not going to. So when that happens, what did you feel? Did you think, oh man, this is the best thing I've ever done, having an affair. That was awesome. When you went back to that substance stuff and you woke up from that stupor, was happiness and joy and satisfaction what you felt? No, it was sorrow. When you went through that webpage for the hundredth time after telling yourself you wouldn't, what did you feel when you eventually got off the computer? Did you feel joy? Did you feel happiness? No, you felt shame. You felt guilt. In some cases, you felt anger. It's like, why did I do that again? That's what he's talking about. They overpromise and they under under deliver, or even more that it's, it's even good stuff, like you want a relationship. We talked about this before. You want a relationship, I wanna get married, I wanna get married, and what you say, and there's nothing, marriage is a phenomenal gift. It's a phenomenal gift, young folks. It's a phenomenal gift. Your spouse is gonna be like the biggest, best gift you ever get, but if you turn that in to I cannot be happy unless I am married, unless I find the one, 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 unless I find that one, I will never be happy, then what you'll do is you will end up probably smothering that spouse to begin with. It's called codependency, by the way. I gotta have this person to make me happy. And you try to have them be your savior, you will eventually turn on them. The old saying is, who I idolize, look what they'll do for me. You will eventually demonize when they cannot come through because they weren't built to do that. Great gift, terrible God. And verse four goes on and he says, there's some things I'm not gonna do. And these are some good things. He says, their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out nor take their names on my lips. Now, by the way, this is just kind of smart. He's like, you know what? I'm so wary of those gods. There's some guardrails I'm gonna put up. There's some guardrails. Guardrails are good to have. They're good to have. Puritans used to call it mortification. I gotta kill this thing in my life. If you're not careful, all that becomes is behavior modification. And there's nothing necessarily wrong if, if, is in its place, but behavior modification is basically like, listen, if you have a gambling problem, stay away from casinos. If you have a porn problem, put a filter on there. If you have a, uh, if you have a booze problem, take all the alcohol out of the house. If you have an anger issue when you get mad or you find yourself getting mad, take a deep breath, count to 10, whatever. If your marriage is in trouble, have a date day every Friday or whatever. And those are not necessarily bad, but listen to me. If that's all it is, this is super key. If when God's pinpointed something in your life, if all you do is try to remove that thing, that little God out of your life, and you do not replace it with a love and a passion for the God, it is just a matter of time before you continually go back to that trough. The Puritans, the Puritans a guy named uh, Thomas Chalmers, I'll give you two examples. One like old school, if you're a church history buff, there's a guy named Thomas Chalmers. He wrote a whole article about the, the, uh, the, the power, actually I wrote it down, the expulsive power of a new affection. The expulsive power of a new affection. And what Chalmers was saying, Chalmers was like, there is power if you have a greater affection for something else than there is just saying, you know what, I'm gonna try to tamp down the affection I have for this over here. Let me give you a, more modern day example, all right? I did not know what a chicken fried steak was until we moved to Texas when I was in fourth grade, okay? I don't know where I was. I didn't know what a chicken fried steak was. And then so when I hear chicken fried steak, when I heard it the first time, I was like, I think I was going to Grandy's. I don't know if Grandy's is still around, but I'm like, chicken fried steak. Let's get some chicken fried steak. And I realized that really that's not even steak. I mean, it kind of is, but it basically is taking like the least expensive piece of meat putting a ton of batter on it 
and then some ranch dressing and calling it a steak. That's basically what it is. Now, is it good? Yeah, it's pretty good. At least it is for like an hour or so. And, but, but it's, it's a chicken fried steak is like, yeah, it's pretty good. You put enough white cream gravy on there. It's pretty amazing. Granted, it is good. But if you lined up a chicken fried steak, it doesn't matter where it is, Cracker Barrel, Grandy's, wherever. If you say, would you like a chicken fried steak or a 12 ounce ribeye steak, which one do you want? Listen, there is not a saved person at church today that is gonna pick the chicken fried steak over the ribeye. There's not. There's not as, why? Because this is so much better. So that might be a little bit tempting if you have nothing else to compare it to, but when you compare it to a ribeye steak, there is no comparison. That is the power of a greater affection. And loved ones, I say all that to say this. If you're like, I'm trying to be a better husband, I'm trying to control my anger, I'm trying to control my lust, I'm trying to control whatever. If you don't accompany all these accountability things with a greater love for Jesus, and if Jesus does not stir up in you an affection, for Jesus, as the Spirit of God takes the Word of God, shows you the story of God, and then you step back, and you are awed by the beauty of the gospel, it is just a matter of behavior modification, and it will not last. And so what we talk about all the time is going back over and 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 over. God's grace, God's love. The Bible says we love him. Why? Because he loves us. Verse 5. The Lord is, and this is where, this is the expulsive power of a new affection. Verse five, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. You see what he's doing? He's making a choice. Chosen portion is like, you're my passion. You're who I'm going to pursue. You're who I'm going to worship. You hold my lot. In other words, what he's saying, you are enough. You are enough, God. You are more than enough. You are who I chase after. You hold my future. My anxiety is gone. That's what a lot was. A lot was what they would do. It's kind of, think about a straw. They would like take a straw and it's like, okay, if you get the short end of the stick or you get the short straw, then too bad, too sad. And what he's saying is, God, you hold the straws. You hold the straws, you hold the sticks, you hold the future. And because of that, I can, I, I can say you are enough. I'll give you one, one example that you can think about this way. Because if you have everything and you don't have Jesus, all the stuff you have, by the way, if you don't have Jesus, all the stuff that, all the good gifts, you really can't enjoy them as much as the Christians should. Stay with me on this. If, all, if you don't have Jesus and you get all these gifts, then what happens is the gifts then terminate on themselves. So go back to the ribeye. I know I'm making some of you hungry, but if you go back to the ribeye, all I can say is if I don't have Jesus and I'm like, that's a good steak, that's a good steak. Or if you have a great dog, well, I got a great dog. That's all you got. That's all you got. Oh, I got a great dog. But if you're like a Christ follower and you see that, you know what? God gave me that steak. God gave me that steak. Not only do I say, thank you, God, for the steak that I'm about to receive. Thank you for that cow that got taken out so I can have a great ribeye. Thank you for the hunter who took down that cow. Whatever. Don't, don't, don't stop me. I'm, I'm on a roll. So if, if, I'm, if I'm thinking that then... It doesn't just terminate on, man, that's a great steak. It terminates back to say, man, I got a great God who gave me a great steak because God's a good God. If you don't know Jesus, then all it is is like, mm, that's a great steak. I kind of deserved it anyway. I've worked hard all my life. That's why he says, uh, I've, I've this, take two guys in the Bible real quick. You got a guy named Job who had everything, lost everything. And then he said at the end, he's like, you know what? My redeemer lives. My redeemer lives. Then you got a guy who had everything and chased after everything named Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. And you follow that whole book. It's kind of a crazy book. You read the whole book. It's basically this story of a man pursuing everything, every avenue of pleasure. And at the end, he just says, it's vanity. It's empty. I mean, read the book. The book basically says, I'm going to find pleasure in partying. And he has some, he has some parties, folks. I mean, he has these amazing parties. He's like, that ain't working. Then he kind of pushes it on a little bit more. And he's like, well, I'll tell you what, parties aren't, parties aren't working. I'm going to go, I'm going to throw myself into business. So he builds this massive business and he's like, well, that's not working. And he's like, well, maybe it's sex. And he throws himself and he's got all these concubines and he's like, this is amazing. And finally he's like, well, that certainly isn't working. And then he's like, if that doesn't work, I'm just going to retire and have leisure and not work at all at all. And he's like, that finally isn't working. And finally what he says is, it's just empty. It's just empty. And what the psalmist is saying is this. The psalmist is saying, you're my portion, you're my joy, you're who I find satisfaction in. And then he's grateful. 
Verse six, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. Here's a little uh, real quick hint. It's like, what does that deal about instructs me in the night? Um, have you ever fallen asleep while you're praying? Raise your hand if you fall asleep while you're praying. <laughs> Some of y'all are such liars. I mean, seriously. If, you don't pray then because most everybody... I've fallen asleep a bunch of, that is some of the best sleep, by the way, you will ever, ever have. I mean, you're praying, you're pouring things out. I'm not saying it's awesome or a badge of honor. I'm just saying there's something about when you've read the word and you've been praying and then all of a sudden you wake up the next morning and a lot of the stuff that was so anxious in your life, God like took the nighttime, which he created and took the sleep, which he created. And it's like he settled your whole being down. And sometimes he even gives you direction while you're that way. Now, if you just... Look at Twitter right before you go to bed. You're probably not gonna get a little counsel at night. But if you like read the word and you're praying, you go to sleep, it's amazing how he gives you counsel even at night. So verse eight, I've set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. And now he's talking about walking in victory over all those idols. So verse one, he's like, preserve me because he's, he's upset. And now he's like, I'm not gonna be shaken. And you're like, well, what, how does that even work? You know how it works? It were, I see it every Sunday. You come in here and we sing these songs and you get so fired up. And then by Wednesday, you're like curled up in a fetal position on a beanbag chair, wondering if God even knows your name. And what he's saying is, listen, I have chosen to put the Lord in front of me over and over. He says, always, always before me. I set him before me, in front of me. And um, what you need to understand and what David is confident in is David is confident that even in the midst of his struggle, God has not abandoned him. You'll see that in a second. You'll see that God actually, and one of the things he's gonna say in about 20 chapters, he's gonna say the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. And that's where some of you are today. Your heart is broken over whatever. And you need to understand that God has not abandoned you. He actually rolls up his sleeves and moves towards you. And I'm not just talking about the omnipresence of God. Well, like God's always with me. That's not talking about that. I'm talking about unlike any other time in your life when you are really going through hell and you are crying out to God, God moves towards you. And it's like, listen, I see it. I am here. All right. So for true confessions, about a week ago, I had an external camera system put in at my house. Whatever. So it's got five cameras. So I'm not going to tell you where they are in case you're weirdo. All right. I'm just saying it basically covers the whole house. All right. The outside of the house. And it gives you these notifications when something happens. It's like, you know, and you know, one time it was like a turkey. Turkey went out. It was like, that woke me up for a turkey going across their porch. And you kind of, you play, and so what you do is you play with, it's on your phone, you play with it. It's, it's really cool. But unfortunately, Unfortunately, I found out like Wednesday of this week that not only can I see what's going on externally at my house, I can actually, there's a speaker in the camera that allows me to speak to whoever or whatever's going on. So I was like, too good to pass up. So a notification comes up and my wife is out on the back porch and come on, I mean, you would have done it too. I had to. I was like, I pushed that little phone button or something like that and she doesn't know I'm watching. It's real new. I mean, again, we had it for a week and I was like, hey, Hey, you there, I'm watching. She's like, all right. It was super fun. I tried it the second time and she's like, gotcha, whatever, gotcha. And I'm like, okay. It was kind of like, it's a little bit weird to think, okay, somebody's always watching. I always am watching what's going on on the outside of my house. And about a billion times more, there is nothing going on in your life that God is not intimately acquainted with and watching and can speak to you. And he, again, not just speak to you, but he can organize the situation where when you call out to him, he begins to do things that ordinarily would not have happened. That's why it says again, he's near to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. He might prompt a friend to call. He might speak to you as you just spend time in the word because there's certain things that are like concentrate. You understand that? When you're going through a hard time and you're anxious and you're torn apart and that's a lot of you now, there's non-negotiables. I mean, like what you're doing right now, congregationally, that's like worship concentrate. Remember like those old, I had that orange juice in forever, but I'm assuming they still come in those, those little orange concentrate. And what that is, is that's like orange juice, but it's like compressed 
into a small can and then you dilute it with water, but it makes a big old pitcher of orange juice. That's what certain things are that God gave us in order for us to not be shaken, for us to continually set the Lord in front of us. Things like worship, things like the word, things like praying, those are like concentrate. If I can get those in there, I can add some stuff to them, but guess what? Those are like the non-negotiables. And David's like, I have set the Lord continually before me. You are my joy. I got a bunch of other good stuff. I got kids, I got a wife, I got, I'm a king, I killed a, I killed a bear and a lion. I mean, I got a lot. I mean, David is that guy, folks. This is a, David's that guy. David is that, he's like the Renaissance man. I mean, seriously, I know some of, you got a lot of men's, men's men, man's, what a, manly men. We got a lot of manly men in our church. David is more manly than you, just so you know. He killed, anybody's like, I killed a lion and a bear, did that. Nobody, maybe a bear, maybe. Nobody a lion, nobody did that. Anybody take out like a nine foot giant, anybody? No, he's that guy. But on the other hand, some of y'all that are like more creative and artistic and all this stuff, the brother would like play an instrument and the demons would flee. He's that guy. And he's got all this stuff and yet he's saying, you're the one that I find joy in, God. All this other stuff, they're amazing gifts, but you are the one ultimately that brings the satisfaction. And when he does that, it ends up saying this, verse nine, therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. That's what I said at the very start. We do what we do because we think it'll bring me happiness and the enemy tries to get us to do counterfeit measures that ultimately they might bring some pleasure initially. Parents, don't tell your kids, hey, sin never brings, sin, sin is no fun. Don't tell your kids that, please. Okay. Don't tell, your, don't tell your kids that sin is not fun. The reason I say that don't tell them that because they will know you're a liar. They'll know you're a liar. Sin is fun. It is fun for like a season. The Bible never says sin is not fun. This text doesn't say sin is not fun. It just says ultimately it will lead to sorrow, but initially it's fun. You're like, sin's not fun. You're doing it wrong. You know why? Because sin, I mean, sin is fun initially. It just eventually, it eventually collapses on itself. And so he's like, now my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. So he's not even scared about death. Or let your holy one see corruption. You're like, what? What is, what? What? Here's what's amazing. We talk about it. You start at the very end of the video. The whole book is about Jesus. And I don't know what David knew. What I do know is that Peter reaches way back into Psalm 16 in the first sermon in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter two, and quotes these last four verses. And so in some amazing way, David is like, listen, I don't know Jesus' name. I know the promises, and in some way, and it took like another thousand years before that promise, before that prophecy was actually fulfilled. And then Peter reaches way, way back, and it said that whole thing about joy and rejoicing and Sheol, which is just basically the grave. All that stuff, all that is about Jesus. That's why we say your number one hermeneutic when you read the Bible, your number one hermeneutic. Hermeneutic is just how do you interpret the Bible? That's what hermeneutic, hermeneutic is like the art and science of biblical interpretation. That's what hermeneutics is. How do I determine what the text is saying? And one of the things you always wanna look is what does this tell me about Jesus? What does this tell me about Jesus? And here's the way, here's the way he ends. You make known to me the path of life. We're gonna talk about that next week, by the way. How do I know? Should I take the job in Des Moines or not? We'll talk about that next week, Psalm 25. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forever. Hey, church, who's at the right hand of the Father? So what's David ultimately saying? He's like, my ultimate joy, how much David knew, I don't know. He's like, my ultimate joy, my ultimate joy is gonna be found in Jesus. C.S. Lewis, Lewis said this, if I find in myself a desire or desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Watch, stand to your feet. Just stand to your feet, if you would. Stand to your feet at the other campuses. Here's what we're gonna do. We got about five minutes left in our worship time. You sang a song earlier about the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. So for some of us, we've talked about it, if you're kind of coming back from, coming back from the winter, uh, the, win the winter time, 
back here to the mountains where it's all beautiful and stuff, what we've talked about now for six months, but particularly the last three months in our year of worship, is that we always want to respond to the gospel. And we can respond a bunch of different ways. One of the ways we do is what the psalmist starts off with. Preserve me, oh God, help me, God. Can I tell you this? Sometimes you're like, you know, I did that one time. I did that one time. I went up there and I prayed. If you hadn't noticed, there's very few Sundays that I don't go up and pray. You know why? It's, it's, it's two reasons. It's not just to be an example. It's actually the understanding is I have not because I ask not. It's the understanding that and God tells me to stop, until, until he tells me, stop praying for that, I'm gonna continue to pray for that. It's because Jesus says, listen, knock, knock, keep knocking. It's in the present tense, I'm gonna keep knocking. And so for some of us, I need to pray at the altar. This is what I need. I need some help. Preserve me, oh God. And it could be a number of different things. Again, it could be uh, circumstances. It could be family. It could be work. It could be the fact I, I need to surrender something because they're part of this song that's talking about surrender. I'm surrendered now. I found that much easier to sing than it is to actually do. And I found I got to do that over and over and over again. It's because we jump on the altar, but the problem with living sacrifices is they jump off the altar real quick. And so maybe that's you. There's some things you need to surrender to God. You know you cannot sing that in integrity because it's not surrendered. And so you come and you surrender it now. You're just like, God, I'm giving this back to you. I've taken this relationship. I've taken this whatever, and I'm giving this back to you. That's certainly, certainly uh, appropriate. You're just saying what Psalm 16 verse one says. Some of you, uh, singing is the appropriate response to the gospel. When you sing about the goodness of God, it is a heartfelt expression. God, all my life, and you begin to engage in that. All my life, you've been faithful. And you're sitting here and you're 75 years old and you got saved at 16 and you see how God's been faithful to you. What a great response. All my life, you have been, you've been faithful. You've been so, so good. And so your response will be to sing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna respond. If you need somebody to pray for you, a lot of times somebody might just come and put their hand on your shoulder and and uh, silently pray for you. Don't panic about that. That's just, part of, that's just part of people interceding on your behalf. So let me pray and then we'll respond. Father, thank you for the goodness of God. Thanks for the gospel. Thank you that we never have to look at our circumstances to see the love of God. We can look back 2,000 years ago and we can see the cross of Christ and know that you are good and that you love us. Gotta pray these next three or four minutes that we would take seriously that you actually move toward us in our times of hardship and difficulty, stress and strain and anxiety, that you call upon me in your day of trouble. Call upon me in your day of trouble. Help us to be a people that simply take seriously the word of God and the invitation of God to do just that. God, I pray the next few minutes that if we're not praying, we're singing. We're singing about the goodness of God. The people waiting for another service would say, man, those people like really believe God is good. God's good all the time. We love you. Thank you for a guy like David with all his faults and foibles. He gives us a lot of hope because he was a worshiper. His DNA was a worshiper. Help us do the same thing, praying, singing, or bringing right now. In Jesus' name, amen.